Okay, we are live. We are live. Let me just wait for Rockfin to give me the go-ahead, and we will begin this live stream. Give me one sec here. Come on, Rockfin. Where are mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's go. Mm -hmm. We have with us Alexander Mercurius, the Oracle of London in London. And we are very happy, very honored to have with us mm -hmm. one of the best geopolitical analysts out there, mm -hmm. Mr. Mm -hmm. Matthew Errett, or Matt Errett, as I can see down below uh, over there. Mm -hmm. Matt, you are joining us from Montreal. It is a pleasure and an honor to have you with us. I have links to, to your website, to your articles, and I also know you have a new book on the way out. All of that is in the description box down below, and I will add those links as a pinned comment when the live stream concludes. Matt, how are you doing today? I'm, I'm doing great, Alex. Alexander, thank you guys finally for mm -hmm. uh, yeah this chat. I'm, I've been looking forward to this for a while, and, uh, and I'm happy that it's happening. And, and those remarks, the best geopolitical analyst, I can't wear that hat. I mean, you guys are worried already. So. <laughs> but okay. That's very kind, yeah. That's very kind, Matt, especially coming from you, I must say, given what right. a great analyst you are. Absolutely. So we have a lot of uh, ground to cover. Let me just say a quick hello to everybody that is watching us on Locals, the Durad.locals.com, on Rockfin, on Odyssey, Rumble, and YouTube. And a big shout out to our moderators, the best in the world, Alan Watson, mm -hmm. William Justice Reckless Abandon, Zarael is also in the house. And who else is helping us moderate? I'm also going to help out on the moderation as well. So thank you to our moderators. Good to have everybody here joining us for what is going to be an amazing live stream. Alexander, I am going to pass it off to you so we can talk uh, the multipolar world order. Let's Absolutely. Begin. Let's begin. And because this is, of course, a topic that's been brought up by Russian President Putin, by Chinese President Xi Jinping, you see... It mentioned, discussed in many places. You see it discussed in the Indian media, in Africa, in Latin America. You don't see it discussed so much in the West. I hardly ever see that word multipolar, for example, appear anywhere in the British media. And, you know, in the West, we are, I think, very much in denial about this. But we have with us today Matt Errett, who is an absolute um, wizard and genius at discussing this kind of topic. It's something that, you know, he, he knows incredibly well. And this is, we're very, very privileged, extremely privileged to have him with us today. And of course, we are at a moment when we can start to see multipolarity actually assert, assert itself. Now, consider what's happened over the last couple of weeks. We've had Lavrov going first to the Middle East and then to Africa, touring uh, Middle Eastern and African countries. We've had the Saudis appearing to align with the Russians on oil prices and things of this, this kind, playing an active role in brokering exchanges of prisoners, first between Britain and Russia, and now between the United States and Russia. This is something really extraordinary. We have Xi Jinping, uh, visiting the Middle East. He's gone to Saudi Arabia. He's met the king. He's met the de facto leader of Saudi Arabia, the crown prince. Crown prince, we'll call him MBS. Um, a controversial person, to put it mildly, but nonetheless, an interesting man. We also have the other side, the United States. They're trying to hold an Africa summit at the moment. And I get to open up by asking Matt about this because I've been following the sort of mood music that comes out of these summits. And I found the Russians, when they came to the Middle East, when they came to Africa, there was a dialogue. They, they, they spoke to the Arab and African leaders. They wanted to hear what they had to say. There was an interchange of views. When the Chinese came along to the Arab world, when Xi Jinping went to Saudi Arabia, it was the same 
though perhaps even more so with massive, massive deals with being done. Now the United States is holding an African summit or has been trying to. And I found it was the same hectoring, the same demands, the same attempts to lecture people, telling people, look, big story for you and for everybody is Ukraine and you've got to be on our side. So the one side, China, Russia, play multipolarity. They say they're in favor of it. The United States at some level understands that it has to talk to these countries but it does so without any real conviction. It can't put aside the fact that it's still in its own self-belief, the hegemon, the unipolar world, you know, pole, and that it expects others basically to do as they're told. Now, is that a view that, um, you know, just my view? Is it is it a view that you think has any value? You, what you expressed was shared by, I, I mean, as many heads of state and their assistants and executives from the, the African community that I had seen uh, respond to the different various threats that folks like Anthony Blinken had beset upon them over the recent months visiting South Africa, various places in, in Blinken's infamous uh, tour uh, in the wake of Lavrov's much more successful tour, um, and then coming out of, I think, the, the current December 13th to 15th U.S.-Africa summit, I mean, building up to it, there's been so many um, messages delivered by African leaders that Russia and China are talking to them, uh, are, are actually working with them, not talking at them. They're 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 actually offering to do things that out that the African leaders of the the continent know is required, and there's no fooling them. They know who has been uh, undermining their aspirations for modernization and development for the past seventy or eighty even years mm -hmm. in the post war post World War II age. And then before that, frankly, it was the same game, but played a little with some slightly different players on the uh, on the forefront. So I mean, Africa knows who's been raping them and holding them back. And despite the fact that many of these leaders like Museveni, who's done some atrocious things on behalf of various uh, Western agencies over the, the 1980s, 90s, uh, even more recently, has come out real, you know, speaking openly, saying, well, we actually have a player in town that wants to provide us the, the tools needed to have full spectrum economies. They don't want to just get us to sign uh, conditionality laced loans the way we've been doing for 70, 80 years, or, and, and which come with all sorts of strings attached. Like we're not allowed to use the money to invest in building up vital infrastructure for our people, the way China doesn't have that problem. China will offer a loan. And even though the 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 spike of Chinese loans that were tied to the BRI um, outlook was much higher in 2018, 19, the, the pandemic obviously forced this to take a, a big hit. Mm -hmm. I don't know the details entirely, but it's still qualitatively much better than anything coming at Africa from uh, West, from the West. Mm -hmm. They're actually they, they're putting money into things that the Africans do need to build up trade schools build up engineers that are then put to work, uh, learning the skills needed to run and operate the rail systems uh, themselves, from Addis Ababa to Djibouti, the various Kenyan rail systems. You have also, and of course it's not angelic, like people say, oh, but yeah, China has their own interests. You know, yeah, they, they're, they're not just giving it away for free, they want things. And it's like, yeah, it's called business. They want things, they, they don't, the things that they want though, don't involve the depopulation of Africa in <laughs> the fight to conquer wars. Or green, mm. you know, boondoggles that won't allow them to have the means to support their own energy sovereignty. The way uh, I think we see a lot of intimidation and threats from the West, saying, "No, you have to do things our way." The the coal and the oil under your your land, that's not really for you to use because if you do, you're gonna, you know, disrupt our our climate agenda. And so you have to use windmills and maybe solar panels to do what export, you know, what little low quality energy you can get from the Sahara up into Europe, who's basically drowning under a false energy scarcity policy. So it's like, who, who are you going to go with? Mm. Exactly. Um, co coming, oh, sorry, I'm, I, I am on YouTube. Coming, coming back to this, what I find it really extraordinary is that it seems to me that Western powers haven't understood this at all that there is this change, that for the first time they're up against an adversary, or well, let's call them adversaries, I mean other powers, that can offer the Af African states, Middle Eastern states, 
all the various full spectrum of things that the West once said it would provide and never quite did, by the way. Um, but they don't seem to see that. They don't want to acknowledge that the world has changed in that fashion. And of course, you get article after article now in, I know this is true in Canada, but in the British media, and they play up exactly what you said, that this is not a good relationship between you and China. The Chinese are going to exploit you. They're going to take what you have. And coming from the former colonial powers being told all of this to Africans, and, you know, I know lots of Africans, um, it comes across as very strange and very arrogant as well. I mean, you know, telling us we can't do business with somebody else who's never colonized us because you who did colonize us and did exploit us. Well, you tell us that that's not that's not in our interests. As I said, it, it it's something that causes a great deal of revulsion in Africa. And again, I wonder why people in the West can't grasp that very basic fact. It's, it, it is, I, I think, just the hubris and arrogance of having no. dominated this, this continent like a slave no. colony, extracting its resources and not giving anything qualitative in return, except for maybe enriching local mini, mini warlords and, and little mini elites often trained, you know, in Harvard, Oxford, Yale, and then sent back to be local managers. I mean, that's what we've largely given to many of these African countries. Look at Nigeria. Look at Congo. I mean, the, the resources and rich, riches uh, that are potentially able to be developed there could propel the, those, those nations far beyond our own in a relatively short period of time if they're given the freedom and the means to actually just develop a manufacturing base, a processing place. But instead, what do we have? We have 40,000 children in Congo working in cobalt mines for our cell phones and our solar, our photovoltaic cells uh, and, and Tesla batteries and stuff. And I mean, it, the, the, the level of, of sabotage is just atrocious. But I think, again, it comes down to the, the arrogance the, of just being in this dominant master uh, caste structure within the hierarchy in the global pyramid for too long. And I think the Anglo-American sort of power brokers have just gotten drunk off of that position and have forgotten that, in fact, the world is, is increasingly moving out of their orbit. There's, there's a new game in town that we've never seen. I mean, if it was just Russia or just China or just Iran, I'd be like, I wouldn't be as enthusiastic. And I don't think anybody would because individually they don't really have the uh, the, the capability of carrying out the type of battle that we, we see being brought online. I mean, each one has, brings certain virtues to the table. They all have certain weaknesses as well. But together, I mean, these are three major ancient civilizational forces which have all combined their their um, their their foreign policy alignments and their concept of self interest, which is important. With a, I think a certain strong awareness of the nature of the arsonists behind the scenes, behind the surface appearance of things, lighting fires. So I think there's a better uh, profiling of the enemy and how it operates than there ever has been in human history that I could see. And the fact again that you have these these different civilizational forces working to create a foundation. Um, a sphere of influence premised around economic large-scale development, long-term thinking the way we used to do in the West when we were still building things, that's long gone. But they're actually invoking those basic principles of action on an economic front that are, I mean, they say the words win-win and multipolarity, but it's it's real. Like that, that is much more meaningful than when you hear Klaus Schwab or, uh, you know, I think I've heard, um, oh, what's the British, uh, Britain's... Uh, Oh, cleverly. I, I cleverly, cleverly, yeah. Don't worry, we, 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 we forget his name as well. <laughs> They're all forgettable. <laughs> he, he doesn't, he's a character who does not necessarily live up to his, his own. Well, actually, he does. You could say he is clever because he has come out with a foreign policy where, where he, he, it seems with his idea of Greater mm. Britain or Global Britain, whatever it is, it, it, mm. it is taking a more slow burn foreign, like a, a long term perspective. Uh, in opposition to some of the more uh, enthusiastic Milnerites of British history who have wanted a more aggressive, like, let's just take, take it back. Let's just get back on the top of the throne. He's like, no, let's just, we're, the world is changing. And he's like, okay, we have to adapt with a multi-generational perspective to building our interests up and have people trust us because they don't trust us. And he's like, there's a certain clever self-examination process there. And I think Klaus Schwab as well, who's, who's also given speeches that have been highly publicized among 
uh, Western audiences around, you know, him saying the multipolar world in China is the inspiration for our world uh, that we envision. And I mean, these are just words. He obviously is a unipolarist using multipolar language, partially to try to seduce uh, countries in Asia and Africa that don't trust him and rightfully so. So of course they say words, but you know, you always look for action. His actions and his ide ideology are 1000% unipolar, meaning one center of command dictating to the world how it's going to fall into line. That's basic, that's unipolar. Whereas China, if you look at the their approach to building up, they've got 140 countries signed on to the, the Belt and Road Initiative through memoranda of understanding. Each one is customized. They're, they're not the same one size fits all memorandum for the 140 countries who have all signed on to varying degrees over the past six, seven years. In, they're all customized to the various development needs and structures that are adopted in those societies that are those nations that they wish to build things in common interest, but they're actually building things and you can measure the the $3.8 trillion of investments, you can look at it, you can track the rate of progress, what has been built when what about the you can track the 30,000 kilometers of high speed rail built up by China where they had zero in the year 2000. Now it's 30,000 kilometers of high-speed rail, which they're going to double soon in the next decade. Canada has zero. U.S. is maybe 160 kilometers, nothing. And it's not even high-speed. It's like pff, half the speed of, of what China does on a normal day. And they're offering it to Africa. They're, they're offering it. They're helping Saudi Arabia build high-speed rail as well. They're offering other Gulf states the means to do that. And at the same time, have the, the upstream and downstream manufacturing of the various sub industries, the machine tools that they are actually helping these countries do themselves, which requires now an expansion of, of economic sovereignty. And so they're doing, and again, so people say, oh, China's BRI, multipolarism, it's just a cover for global one world governmentalism. And, and it's just a neo-colonialism. And it's, look at what colonialism does. And then look at what they've been doing. The effects is everything. They have increased the standards of living, the, the potential population that can be supported, the, the productive powers of labor. In ev any single given country you want to look at, the, we have done the opposite. For 80 years, we have consistently contracted the means of supporting people by undermining the, me the, the ability to utilize viable forms of energy, to, to have industrial economies in countries that are supposed to be just slave colonies extracting wealth out of mines by, you know, Barrick Gold and De Beers and other <laughs> remnants of colonial that are still very active today, M many of whom, I, th I think the majority operate on the London Stock Exchange, and tons of them are, are Canadian and, and operate through the, the British Commonwealth, which still see, I mean, this is an economic power block that people don't realize it's still very, very powerful. Absolutely. I'm, I mean, I'm, at the, I'm absolutely at the center of it and I see it every all the time and it's very visible here in London. If you want to understand empire, this remains to a great extent its capital, if I can say that. But um, I think you actually put your finger on the blind. What is the cause of the blindness? Why Westerners, why Western governments can't really understand what is going on? Because from their point of view, they still own these places. They still have that very much that view. And I don't know whether you're aware of this, but there was a very remarkable exchange a couple of months ago before the great crisis that we're talking about over Ukraine, when all sort of connections and discussions ended between the Russians and the Europeans. And it was about Mali. And this is what Lavrov, who was on the sort of receiving end, said. He had a meeting, apparently, with some senior European officials, EU officials, Josep Borrell being one of them. And the Europeans apparently told him straight out, we don't like the fact that you are in Mali. Get out of Mali. Mali is ours. Apparently, they said it as straightforwardly and as brutally as that. And he was absolutely shocked. He said, uh, he said you know, how can you talk in that way about what is a sovereign country. And apparently there was a bit of a row over the matter, but you know, Mali is ours. And there's never been any denial that those words were said that I'm aware of from the European side. And I think this <laughs> explains, you can't quite imagine 
that that which you've become accustomed to thinking of as your property might have a mind of its own. I mean, that's not how property works. Yeah, my God, I, uh, I I didn't actually hear about that, but it's not surprising. I mean, it's it's absolutely it's it's really this overbearing psychopathic parent type. You know, you can imagine from a horror mm. movie that just wants to keep their kid in a little mm. <laughs> a little cage in the basement, and you know, just always always stay their little baby. Um, and the kid's like, oh, at a certain point, I'm growing up. I gotta, <laughs> and you know, you gotta get out of the house. Uh, but the, but but. Africa was never a child. It was it, it is an ancient civilizational force. I mean, the, the African cultures go back thousands of years. I mean, we're talking like ancient Egypt times here and beforehand where these cultures had developed far beyond anything in uh, in the West for a very long time. And I mean, it was really just with the 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 race to really just gobble up and take control of many of these these territories during the era of the slave trade, a little bit before that with the British Royal Africa Company stepping in. But by the end of the 19th century, there had been so much work to destroy the, the memories, the collective memories, the history books, the, the artifacts, the, the statues, everything of the African people as Western colonial powers decided to just create the borders that we currently see on the map. People are like, oh yeah, the borders on the map. They're just, that's the way Africa is arranged. They chose to organize themselves that way. And it's like, no, that, that is completely arbitrary. That was done coming out of the late 19th century, a lot of these borders. Um, most, a lot of them are, are completely artificial, and a lot of them are based upon the old imperial technique of just profiling different population groups, amplifying or giving support to a, a, a minority group that becomes then your, your favorite people who will then be the administrators of colonial policy like we saw with Kenya with the case of the, the Hutus and the Tutsis, you know, you had one minority group that was assigned to do atrocious things that were given a sort of false culture of arrogance as local managers on behalf of their, their British overlords. And there was a lot of bad blood built up. So as soon as things became expedient to do things another way, uh, the minority group was had the, the carpet pulled out from under them. And, and all of a sudden we had, you know, the encouragement of massacres. Um, but no, I mean, you, you've got an an ancient, ancient mature civilization being talked down to and being told in a paternalistic way, in a tyrannical way, really, that their culture is not one of modern technology, that that's not part of their natural tribal ecosystems. So you have like Western arrogant, um, you know, officials going to Africa and telling them, no, you, you think you want you think you want hydroelectric power and nuclear energy and high speed rail. You think you want these things because the Chinese have been seducing you or because you've been contaminated with false Western traditions. But real the reality is you just want your little local mini, mini communalism like your ancestors had thousands of years ago. And you, you just want green energy. You just want to walk 12 miles to get your dirty water from a well to, to walk back. And that's how you want to spend your days with with infant mortality rates of you know three and five babies in like central the central african republic that's what you that's that's more you and i mean it is so racist it's absolutely racist and i think the the africans who have not been brainwashed brainwashed by western education at least <laughs> who live there actually no no we would rather have all of our babies survive we'd rather have clean water with those you know the basic energy security food would be nice some some means of having maybe look at what Qaddafi was doing I mean, that's one creative example of some of a forward thinking approach to taking that underground wa fresh water in the underground aquifers under the Sahara. We don't know how it went underground, but we know a few thousand years ago, the Sahara was lush and blossoming and green. And Gaddafi had a really great program to bring a tap into that in an organized way. SNC Lavalin from Canada was actually helping quite a bit in that initiative to uh to bring about massive water and food security for the sahel sudan was on board egypt's mubarak was on board as well they were even they even were, were putting forth uh an alternative currency uh you know to fund this thing outside of the imf and, and u.s dollar controls using the uh the dinar and if and, and i think a silverback currency anyway they had a whole alternative currency set up that was moving ahead and uh, unfortunately, at the time, this is 2010, 2011, you didn't, China was not strong enough to really bring online a foreign policy like we had seen after 2013 with the Belt and Road Initiative or the One Belt, One Road originally. Um, Russia was still too weak to start conducting, you know, 
express expressing its um disdain for regime change in action on a foreign policy level outside of its own borders though it had seen what was coming on and putin clearly had said so in, in his munich speech in 2007 but that russia's ability to project itself outside of its borders in the case of only emerged with syria in 2015 so i mean libya poor egypt and and uh sudan were left sort of fighting a battle that they didn't have not have the strength to fight and we saw the consequence in each of those three countries to a devastating degree Whereas, and I mean, that's that's always been the thing. It's divide to conquer. Um, now you have China coming in. You have this whole sphere of influence with the China-Russia special relationship that's bringing in many other Gulf states Gulf states into that sphere. And this is now giving a certain confidence to weak countries to say, okay, with we, we were not going to do it alone. We were not going to go at this beast, this hydra by ourselves. We would get eaten, chewed up, and spat out in a second. But now that we have these these various uh civilizational forces i'll call them that uh more than nation states even that are all working together on various degrees helping with back channel diplomacy help to, helping to heal wounds caused by neighboring countries that have been suffering arsonists from the outside lighting fires on both sides kind of like what happened to the west <laughs> in the the 17th century out of the 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 30 years war you know like look who who was really to blame during the 30 years war was it the protestants or was it the catholics which one of the 3,000 uh, prince electors of Germany were uh, were to blame for the massacres that killed like half the German population in some of the villages? Um, it, it, it was the same bankers, the same Dutch Venetian bankers that were funding all sides for for something more than a religious conflict. They really wanted to create a situation of maximum chaos, divide to conquer, in order to impose a, Levi a Hobbesian Leviathan out of the wake of that thing. And thank God you had leadership at the time that were able to subvert that uh, trajectory into a, back into a dark age that Europe had left only a, a couple of centuries earlier. You had Mazarin, you had Colbert, you had the Peace of Westphalia, you had some incredible backdoor diplomacy tied to some remarkably powerful economic projects that Colbert, you know, really advanced with water projects on the Danube, all sorts of great uh, canal building roads that involved all of these foreign, for, former warring factions to start actually working together and slowly healing the wounds of the past. Just, I admit, wars kept going, but that was a big deal, which set into motion a new idea of the sovereign nation state as a form of, of organization. That's been something that the, the, the we'll call them the globalists, uh, the, 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 the transhumanist type uh, unipolarists have been frothing at the mouth for a very long time to destroy the Westphalian system of the nation state, which is what Tony Blair said in his Chicago speech in 1999. K Kissinger said it so many times that we have to accept the the post Westphalian order. And most people are just like scratching their heads. You know, they like, what, what does that mean? But these guys know exactly what they're talking about. They're talking about the era of sovereign nation states where you respect not just the boundaries, but if you read the the, the first and second articles of the, the Treaty of Westphalia, it's premised around the idea that the sovereign nation state itself is only uh, viable to the degree that it works for the benefit of its neighbors. To the degree that it doesn't do that, it doesn't have self in, its own self-interest. And Article 2 is the principle of the forgiveness of past trans transgressions. And then you have 120 additional articles to satisfy the local desires of, of various warlords. But despite that, those two, that, that's the principle, the, 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 the preamble of what makes the nation state system work and why the oligarchy is afraid of that type of organization because it's not Hobbesian, it's not zero sum. It's not like my interest is based upon my ability to rape and loot my neighbor's interests. It's based upon, no, if my interests are best maintained by creating a, a community of trust, of increasing wealth, it's it's this is the scientific basis of win-win cooperation, which we've forgotten, even though JFK had an understanding of it. Not that long ago, JFK and his brother were shaping policy with that philosophical outlook when they went to Africa. JFK had a program with um, Ghana president, help. Uh, Nkrumah. 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 Nkrumah, thank you. On the Volta River, you know, to build the biggest dam that had ever been built by U.S. engineers, helping to, to train African engineers in Ghana, which they did, and they still have a plaque in memory of, of JFK, who, who Kwame Nkrumah knew very well, was killed by, as an inside job. He spoke, he spoke openly about that. 
before he was overthrown by his own his own CIA operation. Um, but that was the spirit of foreign policy self-interest of a more sane United States. Um, and we have many examples of that for the for the past 200 plus years. But it's been forgotten for the past 50 years, especially totally forgotten. And now people think, oh, yeah, that can't happen. That's why, of course, you know that China's lying because that's a utopian romantic idea of win win and but your interest is my interest. That world doesn't work that way. And cynical, nihilistic people, they just immediately fall into the, the trappings of the, the CIA, the CFR, the, the various, you know, operations that, that run things like the, I mean, there's a lot of psyops going on right now that are trying to t message us that you can't trust anything China's doing. China's the big demonic evil bad guy that did every, everything bad that's happening to us. We can just blame on China, everything. And they obviously want to impose global communist imperialism onto the world and, you know, just do what we were doing. And it's just Freudian psychological projection in my mind. We're mm. Well, since you brought up the subject of China, I mean, I read the Chinese media quite regularly. And one of the things I would say is that the Chinese never claim that they are doing any of this for utopian or as the Soviets used to say, disinterested reasons, you know, that they are, you know, going to sort of just go around and build, you know, railways and whatever, uh, you know, dams and industrialize Africa or industrialize the Middle East, because, you know, this is all something we're just doing out of the goodness of our spirit. I've never seen any Chinese official actually talk in that way. They're absolutely clear about this. They're building up these places because it's to China's advantage to build them up. They see it in a completely different way from the way that it's been done. Now, if you want to compare Chinese approach to building up Africa, the Middle East, wherever it is, to somebody who did talk about it all being done in a very disinterested way, Go back to Tony Blair, who you mentioned just now, with uh, Westphalia. We'll come to that in a moment, actually, because that's an important topic. But I can remember at the G20 summit in Glen Eagles, I can't remember what year it was. I think it was 1999 or sometime around then. He had a great project for Africa. He was going to, he was going to make Africa and the development of Africa the priority. And there was a lot of talk. The whole G20 summit, which he chaired, was going to be all about this. I don't remember a single thing that came out of it. <laughs> there was not a single railway line built, not a single dam constructed. Um, I, I seem to remember something about debt forgiveness programs, which essentially is a mechanism for more debt, ultimately. In other words, you <laughs> create more debt because you've forgiven people so that they can actually just end up borrowing more that was talking about you know being idealistic being charitable something which i'm sure african leaders didn't like they don't like to be patronized in that fashion solving the problems of africa whereas the chinese and you know they're absolutely straightforward about this what they're doing is they're developing business opportunities it's a if you like a very um commercial outlook it's a very straightforward one and you only have to read what the chinese themselves say that to understand what it's about you know we we build up these countries we build up their railways they build they buy our plant we train their engineers they then sell to us we buy from them um and it's a wholly different approach mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah, it's um, it's so detached. I mean, I was just thinking a little bit about Borrell's uh, statement. You know, <laughs> Europe is the garden, and the rest of the world is the jungle, and the jungle grows faster than the garden, so the gardeners have to go out into the jungle. <laughs> it's really creepy stuff. But yeah, I mean, China is going at it from the standpoint of practical action. Like they they mm -hmm. have there are there are Confucian ideals. There there are very deep metaphysical. People say, oh, Confucius isn't metaphysical. There's a Confucian renaissance happening right now that the Chinese government is working very hard uh, to popularize. You could see it in their culture. I watch Chinese movies, uh, TV shows. I recommend people do that if you want to get your finger on the pulse of what the culture is, what type of moral values are being shaped, because it's all the storytelling. It's That's that's the way you're going to do it. Um, compare the quality of the scripts, the stories, the moral values that you get in 
uh, in a, a lot of these things that you can watch, Chinese, again, Chinese movies, Chinese uh, shows, and compare it to the West and the crap we're being fed by Western Netflix and, and Hollywood, and, and it's it's a world of difference. But so they have ideals, but their their focus is there's a problem. Let's try to deal practically with the problem in the West, like you said. There's just mm -hmm. these detached, broad niceties that are said that have no bearing in action when we're doing the very opposite, as you pointed out, on, on every regard. So, mm -hmm. yeah, like China does want to create functional, viable business models. The problem is always, and people criticize China for not being uh, quicker at it in, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, if they really wanted to help, why didn't they already reconstruct Syria and Iraq and uh and why, why didn't they already develop the trans-African uh, high-speed railway the way they've, they've been talking about? And there's like nine different high, like high-speed and, and three uh, conventional standard gauge rail lines for all of the continent to link. That's been on the Africa 2063 agenda since 2014. China has endorsed it. Most of the countries, all fi of the 54 African countries, I think 50 have signed on to the BRI to varying degrees. Um they're, they've been talking about this. It's a big part of the dialogue process that's been going on now for a number of years. But they're, China receives criticism. Like, why aren't they faster at it? Mm. On top of the fact that what China's done already is, is far beyond anything we've done in 80 years for Africa, ignoring that for the moment. Well, it's partially because you have a bunch of arsonists going out of their way, utilizing asymmetrical warfare in Mali with you know various Al-Qaeda-affiliated groups. You have all sorts of operations with the Tigray uh, movement in northern uh, Ethiopia mm. being sponsored by various, mm. uh, you know, U.S. psyopy operations that have been creating more chaos there. You have operations within South Sudan. You have all over Africa various points of fire that have been lit, economic warfare, um, obvious his historical. I mean, there's, there's a lot of artificial influence keeping the the terrain from having the viability needed and the security and stability needed to build these various uh international african projects that require a certain type of stability you're never going to get perfect stability and then build a project like i was told one time at a at a conference on water projects in africa i asked the the speaker who was representing some african country worked at the un and i was like well why don't we you're talking about um these little micro loans to help you know various African countries that have been beset in poverty and war. Why are we talking about, you know, the Trans Aqua project to to take, you know, some of the water runoff from the the Congo River basin and move it up north into the Chad to refill Chad, and that would involve, you know, thirteen countries working together on this type of thing. And and, he, and his response was something I've heard so many people say. Well, it's like the, you see the countries they don't trust each other. They have so much baggage. They're they're at war with each other. They would never work together. And it's like. He's like maybe someday in a in a few centuries when there's peace, then we can build that. And it's like that's never how anything good has ever been built. It's it's never mm -hmm. like we all get to peace and then we build something. It's always the act of doing something that creates the foundation of action upon which we all mm -hmm. begin to realize that we yeah. actually have common interests and can begin to slowly heal the wounds of the past. Mm -hmm. It's always been that way. So this is what China's. I think they, they're in tune with that, but it's slower going than they than many of the Chinese yeah. uh, leadership would like because, unfortunately, again, there are uh, dishonest players trying to stir up the pot in Africa. Absolutely, and that is perhaps where we're going to come to next. But because you talked about the Westphalian system, now I think one of the points I would make about the Treaty of Westphalia is that, of course, what people talk about is, in fact, also what you find in the UN Charter. The mm. UN Charter is constructed on what you might call Westphalian principles. So when mm. people like Kissinger and Blair talk about let's get rid of, you know, Westphalian ideas, you know, that is something they know perfectly well that nobody, very few people have heard of the Treaty of Westphalia. It's something that, you know, is from long ago, 1648, it's a sort of, might be important to historians, to antiquarians, to uh, international lawyers, you know, professors of international law. But very, very few people have heard of it. So it's much more easy to say, let's get rid of that archaic concept of the nation state. Let Rather than say, what we want to do is to deconstruct the UN Charter 
and the entire system of the United Nations mm -hmm. and the whole concept of sovereign sovereignty of states, which is the foundation of the United Nations system as it was originally envisaged. So, I mean, it's, it's a trick. And it's a very successful trick. I'm not saying we shouldn't look at Westphalia because it is, as I said, important and it helps us to understand how we've got here. But it is the UN Charter that they're attacking. And when they're attacking the UN Charter, they're, of course, not just attacking the UN Charter and sovereignty, the concept of sovereignty. They're attacking international law and they are setting themselves up as an alternative to international law. Because any international lawyer will tell you that modern international law is essentially an outgrowth of the UN Charter. Again, we have bits and things that, you know, preceded it and which have become developed into, absorbed into international law as we have it today. But it is the UN Charter that is the foundation document of today's international law. And that is what Blair, Kissinger, Klaus Schwab, all of these people are basically attacking. Yeah, they couldn't come out just at the time, at least. Today, it's maybe become a little bit more acceptable to do this. But back, like I've heard George, uh, uh, sorry, Mark Malik Brown um, giving speeches openly saying uh, the UN Charter is, is uh, obsolete. Um, doesn't fit the world, <laughs> the, the post 9-11 world. But yeah, they couldn't just come out and say it that way back in the 90s, early 2000s. And so, yeah, they would use the Westphalian imagery as a messaging for those in the know what they were talking about. Um, but you're totally right. Yeah, I mean, there it's not like there hasn't been an immense amount of evil done under the UN uh, name. Sure, no one's denying that. But if you go to the heart of the, the origins of the UN originally, and you look at that original chart, you, you just read the first several articles. It enshrines the sovereignty of nation states as sacred. It's, it's embedded explicitly. The idea of the, the, well, the purpose of the UN is explicitly stated as a, a dialogue platform and a means of uh, harmonizing economic policy among, amongst different uh, nation states to bring about the the sorts of things that we saw from the the four freedoms um speech by by Franklin Roosevelt who had you know had this his idea of the four freedoms um the freedom to worship the freedom of conscience the freedom uh, of from fear the freedom of want which was the biggie like the, the actual idea that humanity would these were inalienable rights as inalienable as those found in the US Declaration of Independence and Constitution and enshrined in, in the U.S. founding documents, Franklin Roosevelt, Henry Wallace, his vice president, understood the direct historical continuity of what they were participating in and amplifying in their moment in history that they were on the stage and bringing it to an international level that it could no longer just incubate in the United States, despite the fact that the U.S. has always had these, these fifth columns and you know, Franklin Roosevelt and Wallace understood what those fifth columns were all the way from the very beginning that were never extracted uh, you know, from the U.S., they often kind of like the Gladio operations, you know, these these different fascists acted like they were one thing on the surface, but were always these these very they always had their loyalties to the objectives of the, the Nazi uh, New World Order. They just were now working for Alan Dulles and the CIA instead of, you know, uh, the Fuhrer. But the same thing for the American stay behinds or the, the, the British loyalist stay behinds like Aaron Burr and others. They they acted like American patriots on the surface because, you know, live to fight another day. And if you can't beat them, join them. But in reality, we're always we're, we're never loyal to the true self-interest of the of the vision of Ben Franklin, George Washington, and created things like foreign directed institutions like Wall Street, which is what Aaron Burr created in the 1790s, 1799, by taking over Alexander Hamilton's Bank of New York and converting it into a speculative uh, operation in opposition to the very spirit of the U.S.'s raison d'être. So, you know, you, you had this whole thing grow and incubate also as a bad thing. And so you had these two Americas. That's actually the purpose of a little plug for my book, right? The Clash of the Two Americas is the name of my, my book series. And it's it, you could actually trace the incubation and the, and the clash of these two opposing um, traditions, we'll call it that, with their representatives at each generation 
and Franklin Roosevelt survived his own assassination attempt. Um, he survived a coup d'etat attempt run by Smedley, well, not, run by Smedley Butler saved the day, a, a, a brave general. But, you know, Roosevelt understood from the very, who was behind it. He understood the J.P. Morgan, DuPont, Rockefeller complex and what that represented on the international field. He, he had a very strong idea, but he was able to, he had a very, he was a wise operator and he could play the game pretty damn well. Kind of like a Putin character. You can see him that, that way. A lot of them, a lot of people thought, oh yeah, Roosevelt, he's one of us. He's, he's a rich guy, a rich family, just like us. We, we got him. Um, and then he played the game. And, and when he started getting the actual power that he ne needed, he started pulling the, the rug out from under the feet of a lot of the uh, mm -hmm. these fascist Wall Street types. Um, so all that to say, this, this idea that finally we would be able to actualize the ideals of the American Revolution, but on a global terrain by bringing about the four freedoms as a means for every nation to stand on their own two, two feet with economic sovereignty. Roosevelt had a, pl a plan worked through, and we saw it in Bretton Woods with the U.S. delegation endorsing Tennessee Valley Authority projects for Africa, Asia, India, Russia, South America, and the good neighbor policy of, of Franklin Roosevelt was basically a recapitulation. If you look at it, it wasn't just like a Tony Blair, let's all just, you know, take care of the poor. He actually had programs to use the industrial productive powers that America had built up during the New Deal, but especially during World War II, but convert it into an arsenal of democracy. And he meant it. It wasn't just words to colonialize. He actually had programs worked out with the leaders of Brazil, of Mexico, of, of again, Chiang Kai-shek and Mao both were in agreement on reviving Sun Yat-sen's um, grand strategy for development projects, rail uh, ports all over China that they submitted to the U.S. delegation and, the, and in opposition to Keynes and the British delegation who were in opposition to all of these submissions, all of these projects that Keynes said, no way, we're never going to let this happen. The American delegation under, under Dexter White and Morgenthau, who had a lot more influence at the time, endorsed everything enthusiastically. And you could see all of the projects that they were trying to build up, which would have taken the world in a very different direction because it was premised around a US, China, Russia backbone. Uh, that, and Britain was gonna be dragged along for the ride <laughs> and forced to like learn how to behave like a dignified nation state for once. And, uh, and there were allies in Britain who also liked this idea as well. They didn't like the, the Oswald Mosley, Churchill, you know, racist orientation. They, they wanted to have a real Great Britain that worked as a, as a genuine, authentic country. I think Macmillan might have been one of these characters. Maybe. I don't know. You can correct me. Ever. I, I could be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but but you definitely had a certain spirit of hope and optimism that the world was, was going to be destined for something better. Africa mm. was going... To, Roosevelt had a whole program to make the, the Sahara bloom with great water projects. Um, all of it was sabotaged with Roosevelt's death. And, you know, that was two weeks before the United Nations conference was April 12th when he died. Mm -hmm. The first UN conference was, was two weeks later. If he was present, it would have been a very different ball game. But mm -hmm. the charter was, was designed to inf bring about that ideal and the Atlantic charter, same thing. So when you have Boris Johnson and, uh, uh, Biden going and saying, okay, we've just like done a new Atlantic charter. Uh, it's a complete offense and an attack on the Westphalian spirit embedded in enshrined in the, the first Atlantic charter, which was authentic and good and, and at the UN charter itself, because it's all based now upon mm -hmm. our new priorities have to be based upon protecting nature from humans and language like mm -hmm. that, instead of protecting humans mm -hmm. from imperialists, which is, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's mm -hmm. the, that's what the original. <laughs> It is indeed a profoundly different concert. And by the way, whatever did happen to Biden and Johnson's Atlantic Charter, I mean, which is enormously wrong. I read it, by the way. But I mean, it's it's like uh, uh, Blair's plan at Glen Eagles for Africa. It's vanished without trace. Nobody's ever heard of it since. And nobody, of course, ever will. Whereas the original Atlantic Charter is and continues to be a historic document. You're absolutely right. I mean, there's a major turn in the 1940s, which coincided and was to a great extent caused by Roosevelt's death. I mean, he wanted to take the United States in one direction and it went in a completely different one. But that is the direction it has followed. 
There's been a huge amount of resistance in the United States that continues to be to this day against that direction. That's why we have the political tensions that we see in the United States resurfacing all the time. But the people who won out in the 1940s are still very much in the ascendancy. What are they going to do? Because they see all of these developments. They see, in effect, what you're describing in Africa, in the Middle East. You're talking about a process of industrialization. I mean, it's a, it is a process of industrialization that's taking place in these regions, even as other regions like Europe are busy deindustrializing. So it's alarming because it puts these other regions in a position of much greater power. What are they going to do? Are, are they going to resist it? How are they going to resist it? What are their plans? Do they have plans? Are they able to have plans? And um, how, what what is the response to their plans going to be? Are we going to see more crises? Are we going to see wars? Are we in a, looking forward to a period of intense tension? Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, you you said there's so much in there to unpack, right? Um, no, I I think that we're on the same page, like in the sense that the 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 Western so self-professed elites have become so um, enmeshed with their own dreams and their own uh, flattery, self-flattery of being the best of the best, that they're they're incapable of recognizing the world when it changes and breaks out of their ivory tower plans. As you know, you, the, the, when when you heard Joe Biden writing, you know, in 1992, saying how I learned to love the New World Order, and and Bush and Kissinger all celebrating the end of history, and they they had a very specific idea of like how the script was going to unfold. Now that we've ended history and it's over, we've just got to like pull up, pull together the last rem, re, residues of dissent under this unipolar garb. That was 1991, 92. Mm -hmm. um, since then, especially since 2013, when the BRI was really brought online, uh, the world has stopped obeying their uh, demands. They, you know, as much as they they might scream and shout that the world just conform, and you know, it used to be easy. You wanted towers to fall, you could make towers fall. If you wanted a country you didn't like to be regime changed, well, you could do that too. And there was really very little resisting you all the way through the Arab Spring. And then things got a little bit more shaky. The Ukraine thing didn't exactly go down entirely how they wanted it to, I don't think. Um, Syria definitely did not be, act like the uh, the Libya-Iraq operation that it was supposed to be. Nothing kind of worked. Then you had Hillary, for the first time, one of their, their prize trophies not win. That got that mm -hmm. derailed things and, and pulled out more, you know, <laughs> more wires from the machine, even more under, under Trump's... Um, Somewhat confused, but still, I think a very important disturbance in the the whole operation system as it was supposed to unfold. And um, and I think the oligarchy is just there's still a, the majority of, of the representatives of the oligarchical unipolar interests are still, despite the reality slapping them in the face, that there's this new viable alternative economic system that everyone is jumping on, or most people who don't want to go down with the ship are jumping on board with. They're still incapable of um adapting to that reality and they're still doubling down tripling down on every single front that i could see except a small faction there does seem to be a faction within the 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 uh the oligarchical sort of managerial class jeffrey Sachs, i think represents that who kind of realize maybe this is not in our, our self-interest to burn the earth under nuclear fire maybe we have to you know do a little self self-criticism and reevaluate our approach to maybe fight another day take a more nice nicey nicey adaptive approach to the tempo being set by the uh, especially china mm. in order to try to seduce maybe and and mm. build trust with uh, our our um opponents mm. in order to again maybe subvert them later on and and i mean i don't trust mm. the sacks at all for, frankly when people champion sacks for me i just I kind of have a, a sense of him as what he is and what he did in the 90s overseeing the growth of a cybernetics managerial class in in Russia during the days of perestroika. And mm. I look at what he's done at the London School of Economics, and he's just so self-aware of the type of mm. uh, uh, system of of cybernetics controls that he envisions as being the the at the at the heart of an of, of a new type of system for humanity. I don't trust him. 
But despite that, when he says something good, I will not, I'm not saying ignore it. it, it if he says something reasonable, support it. Um, but overall, I think the, 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 the drug dealers know you don't consume your own drugs, right? You, you're, that's supposed to be for your target audience. You, you sell it, you don't consume it. I think the, the, the Western oligarchy and, and their auxiliaries, their representatives have made the biggest offense that even drug lords know you don't do, which is they consume their own um, narratives and they start believing their own hype. And, and I think that that's ultimately one of their biggest blind spots. So they're not able to create any authentic policy, as you pointed out, like the, the new Atlantic policy or the new Atlantic charter. Uh, where is that? Where, where's their, their green new deal, global green initiative, global green belts. Global, they're they're It's like, it's all coming out of these marketing campaigns um, with people who have no real world skills, no, dis and no intention to do anything good for humanity, but they're all just trying to create a brand, a package to like put forth to, I mean, on the one hand, try to seduce countries that you expect to actually sign on to. What is it? The U.S. is offering $300 million for green de uh, decarbonization policies for Africa or something mediocre. None of these things last. They're just changing their brand again and again. Mm -hmm. And because compared to an authentic policy, like the Belt and Road Initiative, is authentic. It's 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 infused with intention and action. It's authentic. It, it stands the test of time. These things are just like wind eggs. You know, Socrates talked about these wind eggs. It looks like it has potency because it's an egg, but you, you poke it, there's it's just wind inside of it. There's nothing there. <laughs> it, it has no power of self-regeneration or anything. So yeah, they're just desperately just going back to the drawing board. Mm. Do you think that Putin is right, that we're going to be in for a decade of violence and an immense te tension in the international system as the old unipolar forces try to regroup and push back and the more the new multipolar forces uh, become stronger? I mean, he, he did tell us, warn us that we're in for a wild ride, basically. Yeah, and, and the Chinese leadership as well have, have spoken about the, the coming storm. Um, mm. I, I, I don't want to say it's it's necessary, but I, it's hard for my mind currently to see an alternative to uh, a period of, of very tempestuous waters. Um, I think Putin knows what he's talking about. I um, I hope we can get our act. Like, I, here, here's the way I think about it in some ways. You know, like, could, could we have had a piece of Westphalia had we had the world not suffered a period of of pain uh as they had in this 30 years war even before that it's horrific to say it's necessary and i don't think it it probably wasn't necessary because you didn't have to have imperialists starting the fires to begin with so i'm just talking i'm having an, an open internal dialogue with myself here okay sorry mm -hmm. forgive me okay let me let me find another example because i don't want to i don't think that good uh is something that is beget from evil but in the in the real world that we live in, where we do have human agencies with bad ideas mm -hmm. and, and will, free will, um, mm -hmm. dishonestly um, mm -hmm. creating crises, and I can't think of a single war that organically happened. I can't that organically happened as a sociological phenomenon. You know, when you start scratching mm -hmm. at the history of human civilization, there's not a single war that just or organically erupted, or a single terrorist movement that just organically erupted, domestic or other. Um, it seems like. These things always have a lot of input energy um, by forces representing oligarchical agencies of control that want to create divide to conquer and want to bring about the worst in humanity. And then they recast the narrative of what made the bad happen to the victims saying, look, it's just because of that's human nature. That's what we are, is the war making terrorist mm -hmm. blowing up thing like that, that ugly thing. That's us. So we, the real enemy really is humanity if you deal, if you think about it. So even good people mm. who don't like being abused end up thinking like an oligarch over time mm. in their cynical, nihilistic way, saying, well, I guess we do need some sort of a mm. zookeeper managing the human zoo or something. Maybe we just do need to be depopulated. Maybe, you know, we are a, mm. kind of a virus and good people think this way, or at least mm. people who, who mm. are not part of the inside club, you know? Um, so back to your question, okay, on, on Putin's assessment. I, I, I do think we do we do need to be woken up to the the days the 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 sleepwalking dream that we've been in now for a few decades, a few too many decades. We've allowed ourselves 
to let go of the better traditions. And Putin even gave a speech. I, I think it was, I, I'm forgetting which speech he, he, he delivered this, but where he said there's two Wests. There's one mm. West, which is traditional. It's based upon uh, a respect of, of principles, of values. And that's a West that we can work with. And we want to talk to that West. Mm. Then there's this other West, and I'll use my middle finger, uh, that <laughs> is this, this, other thing which we cannot negotiate with it doesn't believe in truth it's post-truth it's 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 everything that that we mm. cannot ever work with that can only come to a fight i think in the same sense that you couldn't mm. really negotiate with the ideology of nazi mm. eugenics at the end of the day you had to kind of battle it out um but there was some it's not to say that that was germany and even the russians said after after world war ii they had signs all over germany saying hit nazism we're not germans Germany, uh, uh, Nazism comes and came and went. Germans are forever. And that was like Stalin putting out these different signage to try to like moralize the Germans who were like all confused and abused in opposition to the Alan Dulles group of the CIA who were like, no, you got the fourth Reich gene. All of you are actually <laughs> the fault of, of you know, Hitler mm -hmm. is caused by all of you genetically having imperial German, you know, genetics. Mm -hmm that are naturally mm. racist kids got brainwashed by this stuff under the, the, mm. the control of U S education policy and, and the CFR, the, 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 the Congress for cultural freedom for like 60 years. So they got a big guilt contract, like guilt trip, you know, that's the German people they're walking around right now under this big guilt trauma, which is being capitalized upon by, by manipulators who are now getting them ironically to endorse a new depopulation policy yet again. Um, so I'm saying all this because, uh, Putin, I don't think the, a, a world war three is necessary, but I think that there will be turmoil. And I think he's right. We do need to wake up and we do need a spanking in mm. that sense. I agree, actually. And I'm going to say just a few com comments about Stalin, by the way, said what he said, um, right in the middle of the war. It comes from a speech he made on the 23rd of February, 1942, where he said, Hitler's come and go. But the German people and the German uh, state will continue. So he actually said that that was when he said it. And of course, it remained his policy. Going back to Westphalia and going back to the 30 years war, what people don't understand about Westphalia is that it was a rather the 30 years war was a response to a universalist project. <laughs> if you study 17th century history, which I absolutely did long ago, but, you know, I studied it deeply. If you see the policies of uh, what was going on at that time, there was a universally universalist policy um, associated with the, with the Habsburgs. They did have this idea of basically unifying Europe with the kind of ideological system that they had in place. And it was a very powerful and a very coherent and very fully thought out you know ideology and concept mm. and of course that provoked a reaction that reaction led to the 30 years war out of that struggle came Westphalia which and the Westphalia itself was in effect a repudiation of what the Habsburgs had been up mm. to that point trying to do mm. and you get the same in a sense, happen after the Napoleonic Wars. You get a situation again when there is an attempt, at least in Europe, to establish a single centre of power. Maybe it's a more complicated idea because one shouldn't simplify too much what the French revolutionaries and Napoleon were up to. But again, out of it, you get a new system, which is you know the concert, concert of Europe, the idea of powers working together towards a certain... Con purpose. Congress of Vienna stuff. Con Congress of Vienna, all that sort of stuff, yes. And then, of course, after the Second World War, again, you have, in response to another project, which in a sense is, you know, again, a, a kind of, you know, hegemonic project, you get the response, the reaction, which is the war, and eventually the U UN Charter, the re affirmation if you like of Westphalian principles so you could possibly say that we're in another cycle like that <laughs> we have had mm. a, a universalist globalist project it's running up against resistance that's mm. going to create a long period of very very severe turmoil it's going to provoke yeah. all kinds of reactions 
around the world. Eventually it will fail, like all of these projects invariably do. And yeah. then we will get to a more multipolar position afterwards, as we have always done in all of the previous cycles. And to those who say, and I know there's a lot of people on the threads who are unhappy about the fact that we talk about China all the time, because China, for some reason, provokes very strong feelings amongst people, some of which I understand. I've been there, by the way. So, I mean, I understand why some people are concerned. Well, maybe one day China will change and we'll find out that, you know, they're like... Uh, the, you know, the Austrians, the, the Habsburgs or, uh, uh, you know, the 1940s Americans, they do have their universalist project as well. Well, that's for another time. <laughs> that's for the future. At the moment, they are part of the resistance to this thing. And, you know, you can worry about what they might eventually turn out to do. But at the moment, as I said, they are part of, the, if you like, the response, the reaction. Yeah to the globalist universalist project that we have now. I mean, that's how I'm going to finish. But um, Matt, do you want to say anything in response to that? No, that, that's a really good point. I had forgotten that there was a Habsburg, oh yeah, a universalist agenda. And it's true, like if you think about it, there, there was always two different interpretations of Charlemagne uh, between, you know, if you look at um, Louis XI, King Louis XI, a, a very powerful and good, a, a good king who in many ways set the foundation of what became the modern nation mm -hmm. state um, and inspired mm -hmm. Henry VII of Tudor um, to do something very similar mm -hmm. along with Cardinal mm -hmm. Morton and who, who trained mm -hmm. Thomas More, who was sort of his uh, eminence grise um, behind the throne. But the, these guys were, were looking to Charlemagne's example and saying, OK, we need to get out of the age of war, of... Uh, of chaos, of empire, and establish a system where the treasuries, as they as they applied them, you know, would not go towards funding mercenaries in territorial conflicts over some hereditary claim or something, as as had been the the, the formula used to get everybody to kill each other for for centuries, but rather towards building internal development projects, cracking down on corruption. Um, both within the church as well as within the the the, the private class, there were there was a huge corruption crackdown in all cases, and also bridge building, training of of orphans, teaching of of young people, education, like all of these things were all happening under this sort of new approach of thinking about wealth creation not as something you extract, but something you create um, from you know so you don't extract rents or or you know cheap labor or steal by by mercenaries doing wars from your enemy but you you can create wealth by actually cultivating the powers of your citizens and the, the idea morally coming out of that was that the king is a servant of the people it's an instrument of god not somebody who is a master over the people because they've got an, an in with god or something you know so it's a very different concept but so they saw they they read what charlemagne was doing from the standpoint of a, of a moral, ethical outlook premised around a love of the people and, in, and an obligate a responsibility to elevate the people to a better way. And this goes all the way up through, you know, Mazarin and Colbert. We're also looking at uh, Charlemagne and from this uh, Henry IV as well, right, um, who was assassinated in 1610 whose death in, large, mm. in, in many ways, you could say, set the tone for what became the, the collapse of diplomacy into the, the Thirty Years' War. But, but Henry IV, as well, of Navarre, was also inspired by uh, the Charlemagne uh, idea, which is the last time Europe ever had, like, a one unified sort of, you know, uh, mm. kingdom, in a sense. It was, it was a giant dynasty, mm. but it, didn't, it was not long for this world. Charlemagne's kids, or his grandkids, were sloppy thinkers, they let themselves sign on to treaties organized by some ultramontanists in the in the papacy in in uh, the 1840s, uh, sorry 840s, <laughs> that pretty much agreed to start you know dividing up the the kingdom and to declare war on their little brother idiot Lothar, you know, who had the the possessions mm -hmm. in the middle, <laughs> and it's like the two the two side brothers were like any type of conflict, we're both gonna fight fight our brother, and it's like what kind of what kind of treaty is that um, under the the oath of Strasbourg. And so all of this stuff went went to hell pretty quickly. But the the idea what Charlemagne set up under Al Quin, his advisor, and, and the Augustinian Platonic Christian movement at the time was solid. It was like based upon like the biggest uh, water projects, roads, um, 
foreign policy towards uh, Entente and, and diplomacy with Harun al Rashid, right? In in uh, the Abbasid dynasty, there was you know envoys with Khazari to the north, and in all of these cases, you had the Silk Road of the Tang Dynasty also passing through, right? So the the Tang Dynasty had also been revived in 618. By 680, they they restored the Silk Road after 400 years of it falling fallow. And, you know, you had these corridors from the north, mm-hmm. the steppes in the north via Khazaria into, into Christian Europe and through the south through the Muslim world with mm-hmm. branches into Africa. And all of this stuff was, was all, you know, all based upon things that were antithetical to systems of divide and conquer and depopulation of mm-hmm. the empire, which has always been oligarchical. Uh, the effect of oligarchical systems of management. So the, on the on the other hand, you have Napoleon who sees himself as like a Charlemagne figure and like has himself painted in the, you know, holding the holding the globe earth, you know, and 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 he sees himself as sort of like a Charlemagne, but with a very different idea in many ways, kind of more mm-hmm. of a proto-fascist smell to it. And then you have again Charlemagne coming up with Count Kalergi or Kudenhove Kalergi talking about Charlemagne. And, and, char- and needing to revive a Charlemagne <coughs> vision for the, the pan-Europa, the pan-European movement that he calls for a, you know, a benign feudalism for the world. So you have these like different opposing currents all interpreting uh, this, you know, what, what Charlemagne did in with very different spirits completely. Mm. But I think that would be good mm. to recast or retreat that history from that standpoint. I've never seen anyone do that before. Mm, it would be. I mean, I mean, just, 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 just to say, if we're talking about Westphalia again, I mean, most people don't know that the motto, one of the mottos of the Habsburg family, which is of course the House of Austria, is uh, are the letters A E I O U. Nobody quite knows what they meant by that, uh, and what those letters were supposed to mean. But the most widely um, held interpretation is. It's Latin, Austria erit in orbe ultima. Austria will be supreme in the world. So, hey, on that point, on that point, there's one thing that you're saying that it's just struck a, a new thought. Mm? The person who led the pan-European movement, founded by Count uh, Kudenhove Kalergi, up until his death in 2011, was Otto von Habsburg the heir to the, mm, well, the Habsburg yeah. Empire? Well, and yeah. what, did, what anyway. did Otto von Habsburg do? What did he create? Uh, along the way is the Humanitae Dignitae Institute mm. uh, out of this 800 year, year old monastery, right? In, uh, in Europe, mm. I think it's in Italy. I'm not even too sure where mm. it is actually, but this thing yeah. is, is, is run by Steve Bannon. Steve Bannon mm. is, if you go to the website, it's Steve Bannon is the, uh, the key guy mm-hmm. who they, they brought in um, as a Habsburg sort of uh, useful character to try to unite the global right, all of the different, mm right movements yeah. under a new anti-China, anti-Muslim sort of outlook, which in my mind, mm. it looks to me like a repackaging of Samuel P. Huntington, but for mm. a more yeah. alt-right audience instead of it being mm. for a, a neocon mm. audience. But it's it's mm. gang counter gang stuff left and right. Anyway, just to come back, as I said, globalism versus the nation state isn't actually quite as new a struggle as people think. And the unipolar versus the multipolar is also something that recurs. And I think that is where we are. Matt, Matt, I think I'm going to stop. We've been talking for an hour and 13 minutes. I'm going to hand over to Alex. Uh, Maybe um, Alex has things to discuss and I'm sure he's got questions that he will put to you from our audience. And thank you for your very valuable insights. We, thank you. We, we, do, we do have questions. Matt, uh, how much time you got? You got 20, 20 minutes? Go through three questions? Is that I good? Like 30, 30 minutes. Okay. Okay. Let's do 30 minutes of questions. Let's, uh, let's start off with a question, Matt, that we kind of brought up before we went mm. live. And it is coming from... Sanchor Laxo, Matt, how do you see Canada's preparedness for the oncoming collapse? Resources per capita is quite high, but foreign companies own most of it, with the crown owning the rest. And Canada was or is still the only country in the G7 without gold reserves. Yeah, I mean, I I don't have positive news on the Canadian front uh, for Canadians uh, on that on questions of that sort. Unfortunately, I I could say that uh, we have a lot of potential. That's that's the best thing about Canada is so much potential, right? 
extremely low population, 35, 36 million people. One of the biggest land areas. I mean, in terms of just the, the quantity of land and resources under the land is just incredible. Um, so if we actually had a, a restoration of a policy that was honest, um, which I hope can, I mean, I, I have faith that it will happen at some point. I don't see the current um, leadership of Canada or the, the devil's pact that the Liberal Party signed with the NDP, which is to not basically have an election until 2025 at least, um, because the NDP is going to go along with whatever the Liberals say on, you know, and it, it's pretty, I don't see that ideological grouping capable of doing the sorts of things that are needed both to to weather the the current storm that's coming on because the financial system is ripe to blow that's true i don't um that requires some very strong leadership that can utilize the power of the nation state to defend the people from the oncoming banking blowout you know there's there's precedents where this has been done we could do that you know i could i can showcase a, a a, a same policy orientation. I'm like, if you're, if you were serious, if, if Maxime Bernier or, or let's say um, Pierre Poilievre from the, the conservative party, if they were serious and were not ideologically committed to absolute free market, do nothing, even if there's an economic collapse, if they weren't that, and they actually chose to shift gears and think about utilizing uh, the power of the nation state to do good as well. Um, yeah, there's things that they could do to, to force the restoration of what's called the four pillars. It's the Canadian glass Eagle. We could be, we could champion, we could see a championing of a policy of the restoration of the four pillars that had formerly separated commercial from investment, from, from trust and insurance, different compartments, so that people who gamble with other people's money and they lose, they don't get bailed out. They, they blow up and they, they tank themselves, but the, the, the savings, the pensions, that's protected. The, 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 any part of the economy which is protected, which is tied to real value should be protected, but only that. Same thing for the USA. So if we were to do something like that, yeah, we could then have feasibly the restoration or the utilization of the Bank of Canada. I, I know that there's no gold, but you know, still you don't need gold. You if you have a a national bank and and projects that are provably going to bear fruit, you could emit credit the way Lincoln did with the greenbacks. It's yeah, it's sort of it's it's kind of pseudo fiat. But it's not really because the real value is in the real world. Are you building up the infrastructure? You know, you think about it's called self-liquidating projects. So there's projects that are inflationary where you just print money to build something, but it doesn't increase the overarching productive powers of society. So you're not compensating for the, the new debt you create. But the self-liquidating projects, which is what we used to learn about before I was born in basic economics, it, are projects which will maybe you have to wait five or 10 or 20 years sometimes because they're big, but when they're built, they're going to increase the productive forces to such an extent that it will not only create new free energy that will extinguish the debt you, you incurred to build it, but there's going to be so much more abundance that could then be reinvested back into the system, improving upon or making new infrastructure or whatever you want to do. And I mean, my God, if you look at the north of Canada, the Arctic, there is so much that we could do by, by extending, I mean, roads and rail up in the Arctic. We could work with the China Polar Silk Road. China has offered with Russia opportunities for us to tap into and develop um, the Arctic with them instead of building, putting missiles in Alaska and, and Yukon pointed it at Russia, which is what some people want to do. Russia has said on many occasions, let's let's work together on, on building this economic potential together. And China's got, again, their Polar Silk Road. It's, it's not just the maritime Silk Road, which it is, but it's also a land-based component, which could involve rail extending through the Bering Strait, frankly. It's been on the books for 130 years. So, you know, we could do these things, but you got to have ideas that are... You have to have a movement in Canada which which is capable of, of speaking with an understanding of the historical forces at play and with a strong sense mm -hmm. morally of where the future can go if we want to survive the, the, the current fire. Um, if you have that... Yeah, there's a lot that can be done. And Canada's population has demonstrated a strong moral quality that that surprised me when I was in Ottawa uh, during the Freedom Convoy. I didn't I didn't think and I don't think that the uh, the social engineers in Ottawa um, expected mm -hmm. that type of multi-million person turnout um, that that showcased mm -hmm. to me a, a, a something to work with. There's something there. Mm -hmm. Fantastic answer, Matt, uh, from Commando Crossfire. 
Can Western economies survive if African states start asking for fair compensation for their minerals mm -hmm. and foodstuff? Aside from the U.S., can the EU afford it? Yeah, I mean, uh, can the, if <clears throat> it requires we do things totally differently, like, eh, yeah, yeah, from the from the principled standpoint, and you guys could chime in. Frankly, uh, I mm -hmm. would say mm -hmm. yes if we started doing honest business and helping these countries to develop their their uh, people and their 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 economic potential to stand on their own two feet to do it themselves, if we actually re restored that way of thinking and paid them mm -hmm. honestly for their resources along the way and, and did honest business, that would be, yeah, totally in our self-interest. And it would be much more beneficial because then we'd have, as a consequence, a market of mm. thinkers and producers who would be able to buy things from mm. us. We would be able to buy high quality goods on top of just minerals and resources from mm. those African nations, which would develop manufacturing as well. Like what, what, how much better, they would be consuming more when you live longer at a higher quality of life, you're consuming more. That's better business partners for us if we cared about real business. But unfortunately, we have this other death cult thing running our, our show that doesn't want that. So that, that's all I'm thinking mm. about it. Yeah. Can, can I just say something? Absolutely, we yeah. can afford it. Because uh, one thing one has to always understand about economies that are extractive and exploitative is that they tend to become incredibly unequal, which is what we have seen happen in Europe and indeed in the West generally. And the reason for that is very simple. The benefits of these kind of systems invariably go to those people who have political and leverage and control and power. And the burdens are borne by other people, by everybody else in effect. So um, rebalancing the international economic system is actually going to be beneficial in the long term. This is my own view to our societies, because it could lead to the rebalancing of our societies internally. And that would be an entirely good thing. And we mm. would absolutely be able to afford it. But of course, it would require, as Matt correctly says, a major change in the way in which our societies are organized. Mr. Wonderful says Indian border guards beat off CCP aggressors at the Himalayan border with sticks yesterday. China is a paper tiger. If that's the worst problem that India faced yesterday, that's not a big deal. I mean, you beat off some some, some <laughs> soldiers with sticks. Mm. I, the world the world's a lot crazier right now. I mean, I think you should be lucky that it didn't inf inflame itself into something crazier. But I think India's current foreign policy, though the, there's a lot of baggage from the you know the India China war from the 60s. There's 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 wrongs wrongs that have been done on both sides. But I think overall, when I'm looking at Modi's overarching foreign policy, I see a lot of synergy with China's mm -hmm. foreign policy on the the points of of principle that matter in terms of you know look at what China's look at what okay compare. India's current foreign policy on the, the north-south transportation corridor that stretches all the way from St. Petersburg down through Iran uh, with uh, an endpoint in India that has all sorts of sub-branches. It's very much in the same spirit as the Belt and Road Initiative. And Western um, analysts have tried to frame this as if it's um, an enemy project to the BRI. There, there is so much synergy between both of those east-west BRI and north-south transportation corridors. It, it's, it's out of the wazoo. There, there's so many points of, of common agreement on the nature of what economy should be, premised around building things, creating things, pulling people out of poverty. And I think the foreign policy, um, on a security level, if you look, you know, India and Pakistan are, are full members of the the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. India and China are both BRICS members, which is getting really, it's going to be getting very big, the BRICS pretty soon. They're going to have to call it something else. But I mean, you know, Algeria, Egypt, Saudi Arabia have all applied for membership. Um, I'm missing a couple too. Um, so you have this whole, I think, what is being said on the surface sometimes still accommodates local prejudices. Kind of like imagine when Trump would often speak publicly and then he'd do something very different. He was speaking because his support base are, and I'm just, I'm, it's, it sounds harsh, but are dumbed down, are dumbed down masses who don't know how to think about history and the complexity of politics. So he would have to market some of his messaging that would make him seem like anti-Russian or anti-Chinese or anti 
But in reality, he would then go and do something like sign the U.S.-China trade agreement that was win-win for both China and China. <laughs> Or he'd do something incredibly reasonable, like you know, show up and, mm. and pull uh, the tension out of the North South Korean conflicts by just showing up, at, you know, having a hamburger with Kim Jong Un and then arranging a diplomatic uh, bridge building, um, and then in so doing, eliminating the the excuse that the U.S. military industrial complex had for building up its THAAD missiles in South Korea or its bioweapons systems in South Korea as well. Um, cause it was all about, you know, crazy evil Kim Jong-un being out of control. That's why we have to do these things. The reality was it's always about China. That It was always about China. Um, so I, I think you have to sort of appreciate some of that what's going on there. Um, I don't know. What, what do you guys think about the, the well, I, I, I'm getting, I'm going to go off of my own a few yeah. thoughts about this. Okay, I think yeah, when right. Modi, Modi, Modi became prime minister, when the BJP, BJP returned to power, I think they were very, very suspicious of China. And I think, you know, this has been a historical thing going all the way back to the sixties, by the way, just to say in the 1950s, China and India had been actually quite friendly and had worked together you know, at Bandung and all those places at the start of the non-aligned movement quite well. But then they fell out badly in the early 60s over the border. There was the border war. There were some very difficult things. And there was a very bad relationship for between India and China. I think when Modi became prime minister, he was very, very uh, suspicious of China. And I think he very much was looking at that time for a close relationship with the United States as a balance against China. And I think well, then what happened was very, very simple. He found what how very difficult it was to work with the United States. I think that it wasn't just him, by the way. I think the Indians generally found that when it came to trying to establish a partnership with the United States, the U.S. treated India again, as it always treats everybody, as in somehow, in some way, an inferior party, you know, the party that was coming to the table asking for help. And, you know, the United States was going to help India. And mm -hmm. it was going, in return, India would have to accommodate itself in some ways to US policy on a whole range of different issues. And I think as time has passed, gradually, mm -hmm. uh, Modi and the BJP, it isn't just Modi, have slowly shifted their policies. And I think they've come to understand that, yes, the relationship with China remains problematic in many respects, but it's not, it doesn't carry the danger of subordination that the relationship with the United States mm. does. And that's why you've started to see over the last few years, and it precedes this latest crisis over Ukraine, a gradual rebalancing of Indian policies. Uh, they, they've gradually started to move back into re-engagement with the BRICS system and the, the SEO and all of those things. And I think this is a trend that's going to continue. And I think that there are so many factors that point to this being advantageous from India, uh, for India, over and above what I've been saying. It gives India enormous leverage, leverage over China, leverage over the United States, leverage over many other countries. That, and they've also learned to, to manage the problem of these border clashes, which recurs every so often, that I think this trend is going to continue. And in the end, it is going to strengthen. Now, of course, Russia, China has had problems over its border with other countries. It has a massive quarrel with the Russians in the late 60s and throughout the 70s and 80s over the Russian-Chinese border. The, Rus the Chinese claimed vast areas or significant areas of Russian territory as their own, for example. And then eventually... The point was reached where the relationship between the Chinese and the Russians had become so close, so many other problems had been resolved, that it really didn't make any sense to continue with this issue of the border any longer. And the two simply sat down and they took out the maps and they sent in the surveyors and they sorted it out. 
And that problem simply doesn't exist anymore. And mm. I wonder whether eventually, given, as I said, the direction of travel in Indian-Chinese relations, something similar might happen there too. That at the moment, the Chinese and the Indians still have these issues with each other. They're still maneuvering around each other. The Indians have come to understand that, you know, they can't just be allies of the U.S. against China because that's not in their interests either. Yeah. And that eventually, with economic contacts, China's India's biggest trade partner, economic contacts, the BRICS relationship, the SEO relationship, all of that, there will come that point eventually when the two sides will do exactly what the Russians and the Chinese did in the 90s, which is sit down and work it out. Well said. All right. Uh, Barry says, I'm reading Matt and his wife's books, and I highly recommend everyone here since mm. most of you would appreciate digging into deep history, deep sea of history. Mm. Cool. Fantastic. Uh, Commander Crossfire asks, can Egypt and Ethiopia mend ties, or is Egypt too afraid Ethiopia <coughs> will overshadow them? <laughs> economically and politically. I would love to get Alexander's take on this. I, I don't know personally what the hell is wrong with... I mean, Egypt has made some belligerent statements regarding the uh, the Grand Renaissance mm. Dam, the Gerd Dam uh, being developed as one of the most, in my view, mm. one of the most inspiring projects of African recent history. Um, you know, I mean, like, this is a 6,000 plus gigawatt project that's nearly finished. They're, they're, they're in, like... The last phases right now um it is a dam which is purely done it's, it's built for providing a massive amount of hydroelectric uh power not just for ethiopia but for the surrounding horn of africa it's um <clears throat> it is a, a, a huge stabilizing force and there's a lot of poverty there as people know um mm -hmm. vitally needed vitally needed. there is no claim that this is going to be used for taking away water from the nile which which runs off into the into the mediterranean and i mean egypt right now and and some some in sudan are uh, freaked out by the idea that ethiopia is going to use the dam to steal their water um and screw mm -hmm. them over um i've seen no reason I, i'm looking at the explanations from the ethiopian side and the the engineers who have explained this again and again it doesn't seem to be the case at all that this is going to happen there will be no water depletion um but they've been threatening saber rattling even threatening i mean various officials within egypt and sudan to to bomb the gird um mm -hmm. i don't know what is compelling them when they have so much to gain by the success of this project and uh mm -hmm. I don't think so. I, I partially think it's words. Mm. I think they're using words possibly to accommodate some some power brokers in the West who want to see the GERD fail mm. um, and would rather see these countries go to each other's throats. Um, mm. But I don't know. I don't. What do you think, Alexander? I, well, I, I'm going to be straightforward. I mean, it, it isn't actually a topic that I'm very, very well informed about. But um, you know, I take what you say about the dam. I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on this particular dam. My own view is that, again, Egypt and Ethiopia have many friends in common. Russians mm -hmm. have a very good relationship with both countries. China has a very good relationship with both countries. I think that they have, again, lots of commonalities of interest on many issues. I think that eventually, in time, they'll be able to sort out any issues between them over this dam without having to go to war with each other, which would, I think, be extremely difficult and not just difficult, but frankly, contrary to each of their interests. So I think that they will find a way eventually to sort this thing out. And it may take a little while. There may be issues. The Egyptians obviously have historical concerns about, you know, the Nile water flow and all that. Um, but I think that eventually, as I said, they will find a way through. Toilet Sauce says, the West scrambles for Africa again. The first time was tragedy. Will the second time be a farce? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, I, I'm going to say, I'm going to say something about that. I mean, you know, if you look at the people who were, you know, behind the the scramble for Africa in the 19th century, I mean, you had some very sinister and dangerous people like King Leopold of the Belgians, some people like Lord Salisbury, you, had, you know, Bismarck, all kinds of people like that. But you know, whatever they were, they were strong, 
personalities. Look at the leaders of the West today. I mean, they're not in that league. Uh, I mean, I, one has to say that. So they won't succeed. You can't imagine a sort of Blinken figure having the same kind of effect that, say, Salisbury did in the 19th century. I mean, it just isn't going to happen. Sam Whiskey asks, is the ghost of the Eastern Roman Empire still haunting the West? The, 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 oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, the, East, the Eastern one. Eastern, sorry, I didn't catch Eastern that. yes. Yeah, Eastern. like Eastern. Russia and, and, and Byzantium. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. There's something mm. very, very um, frustrating uh, within that within Russia's deep history, which I, I think has pissed off many generations of oligarchs. Because um, mm -hmm. look, I mean, at the end of the day, the the, the oligarchy. One of the the key objectives is to it's all it's cultural warfare. Okay, politics, economics, it's all downstream from culture. If you want to understand where the real battleground is, you got to go to the cultural fight, which is what a lot of people they don't spend enough time appreciating that domain. They want to create cultural matrices standards of of what shapes our passions how we think not what we think about things but how we think how we formulate ideas our identities our ideas about our, ourselves right this is where you, you can really get the power right because then you can get people to acquiesce to their own enslavement and think that it's it's called you know freedom and cotton candy um so what they've really wanted is a, a global feudal slave state that thinks that feudalism is freedom. Um, they've always wanted that. That's not like a new transhumanist thing that they just came up with. That's always been there. Um, they have a glorified, romanticized idea of feudalism. Um, and, and it's based upon an acceptance that your cultural values and traditions have to be abandoned because many of those traditions are not compatible with submitting your child into slavery or reducing your standard of living, right? Our, our religious values, many, most of any, anything good in religion tends to be mm -hmm. antithetical to those sorts of actions. Uh, same thing for the, the family units that have carried mm -hmm. forth the incubation of the souls of children, you know, uh, that could feasibly enforce the souls of children before they go out into the school system, into the real world. Um, those things have been attacked. Religious institutions, nation, the nation state system, um, family units have all been directly attacked by folks like Julian Huxley, who founded transhumanism, um, you know, G. Brock uh, Kissholm, founder of the World Health Organization, Tavistockian guy. They've, they've all identified correctly so that these are incompatible with their idea of this malleable, mushy, adaptive uh, species that would just adapt to whatever type of post-truth value systems you brought online that would then facilitate the imposition of a new structure of control. So, I mean, with, with Orthodox religions, including Jewish uh, Orthodox religions and, and Christian Orthodox religions, they, they're, 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 they're unwilling to bend and adapt and let go of their traditions in accommodation of anything. Um, so in that sense, that has played to the favor, the survival favor of, of I think Russian Christianity quite a bit because they're like no we're not going to sabotage ourselves and our, or, or sacrifice our principles for the sake of this mm. new world order ethic. Um, nothing mm. would allow them to do that, and so that has mm. been maintained and um, that uh, over many generations. And they they want to destroy that that unbendable unbendable quality, but but yet it's bendable as we see today, right? And in, in the best examples of Russian history, it is bendable to moral reason. So it's not like Russians can't, who are Orthodox, can't work with other cultures, whether Buddhist mm -hmm. or Hindu or Muslim mm -hmm. or anything. They can, and they do. But it's only when all of those, their partner civilizational forces are also acting in a moral way in accordance with their own self-interest, then we have really good synergy. Um, otherwise, no, they, they, but, but this is where I think even Count Kalergi, who I, I mentioned, and a lot of racists latch on to Count Kalergi, uh, Kudenhova Kalergi for like one single aspect of like some Kalergi plan. Uh, that That's the, one of the least important things about Kalergi. Um, this guy represented some of the highest grand strategic forces of the Habsburg Empire at, when he created the pan-European movement, uh, pan-Europa, which brought in mm -hmm. like Hjalmar Schacht, uh, you know, high-level Mussolini mm -hmm. operatives. Everybody were part of this thing, including the CFR and Roundtable Movement, Milner groups. All of these people mm -hmm. were all like in, in bed with this uh, strange thing from the 1920s, but 
he he points out that there's um two types two sects within Judaism that um have to be dealt with. He's like you got the the orthodox Jews, they're they're what he calls the bad Jews because they're not going to adapt to the type of um benign global feudalism that he demands with its its cultural matrix that that is demanded, you know, of everybody just ex- accepting to live with everybody else with no judgment, right? No judgment of right or wrong. It's this this post-truthism LGBTQXYZ thing. Um that so you got the bad Jews who won't adapt. They're like the orthodox types tend to be in Russia. Um then you got the good Jews who will adapt. Those those are the good ones. We we can get the, we can get them to just adapt to whatever we make for them. But the bad ones, what are we going to do with them? And uh, people like Oswald Mosley, right? British Union of Fascists was a big part of this. What he, and, you know, they were talking about, let's just put them in a controlled area and we can manage them that way. And we can inflame certain passions uh, within mm-hmm. them in a controlled zone um, and turn them, you know, amplify what became, I think now you can look back in hindsight and see like, okay, that's the Jabotinsky type of ideology mm-hmm. or that those groupings of the greater mm-hmm. Israel prejudice sort of ethno-nationalist types. That those will those are useful. We can we can we can pervert it into that which becomes useful to us. But mm-hmm. um, they, they think the same way for the for the Russians too. They're like we got to just destroy it. Uh, we, there's nothing that they could do to corrupt it in that sense. Uh, that it, or at least it's not very easy to corrupt. So yeah, they've been trying for over a thousand years, I think, to destroy that uh, quality of Orthodox Christianity for sure. Hmm. All right, Uh, we'll do a couple more from Hunger the Die Merchant. I strongly disagree with your guest. What were the African and Middle East economies pre-imperialism? The Mm. West brought swarms of technology with them, such as the Indian railway system. Even the Ottomans brought in German industry and Mm. rail. Okay, Uh, well, I... You're, you're, the commentator seems to be just a little bit ignorant about certain things uh, regarding colonialism and the battle of how these forces destroyed mm. the actual cultural heritage of the various mm. target countries that they went into control. And yeah, they built up rail systems in India or in Africa, but you'll find that they consciously built them in such a way that did not benefit the overarching people or the nations that they were uh, raping. They were literally to the mine, to the port. And they were all built, if you look at the, the what the colonialist powers all agreed to do when they were building uh, the rail to extract the wealth from Africa, they all made their gauges incompatible gauges so that no Africa could at any point in the future ever build common uh, rail that could connect to each other to keep them all divided to be conquered. That intention is there. Um, as far as what was Africa before that, it's difficult to say in some ways because they were so systemic in their destruction of mm-hmm. the libraries, of the museums, of the heritage sites, of, of so much. Um, that, like, look at what the British did in India. They, they cut off the hands of something like 30,000 or so uh, in, Indian master textile uh, producers. They cut off their hands. India was the biggest GDP of the world for, in, in the 1790s, right? Right. Un- Sorry, India was the biggest GDP right under China, far, far beyond anything Britain or European powers were in re- in, in relationship. And you can go online and, and even on YouTube, there's some really good animated infographics where you can see the 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 destruction of, of India and China's GDP after um, uh, uh, England steps in and, and wants to, you know, destroy both, which they do. Um but, but they destroyed, they, they made it practically impossible for Indians to practice the textile manufacturing uh, production systems that they had been doing for centuries, becoming the, the, the best of the world. And they, you know, Britain basically took control of that during the 19th century, especially, and reserved a, a near monopoly right with the enforcement of the Bank of England or the, the, the city of London as a center, a nerve center of global finance then as it is today. And the British East India Company, which migrated and morphed into the 20th century in, in a few different corporatist ways. Um, but, you know, like, y- you got to look at things from a more critical eye. Like, look at your past from the the knowledge of how oligarchies work mm. and how they've destroyed the good. Mm. Um, so, I mean, you got to reevaluate what you think you know about this. All right. Uh, from David S., any sense oh, of I the think, outcome? I think Alex, Alex is speaking. Oh, is he? Oh, but he's, but he's on mute. Yeah, I'm still, I'm still muted. muted. 
Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm muted. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to add something to that because that is, by the way, what, what, what the commentator has said is actually a very, very old stated opinion. Even Marx sometimes in the 19th century spoke like this, that, um, you know, European colonialism is extractive and exploitative, but it is in a kind of a way promoting technological progress in the countries that it conquers. The problem is the technologies that are ex ex exported through colonialism to these societies because they are very much connected to a colonial system that is extractive, after a certain point become stagnant. <laughs> they, they, they make development, actually, in these countries themselves, much more difficult than they might have been if these technologies had either been brought in or had been developed organically. I know this is, by the way, uh, you know, um, what I'm saying is actually a fairly widespread view amongst academic economists now. So, yes, they have railways, but those railways are built to operate a kind of system which Matt was describing. But those railways, because they're not really adapted for organic economic development, they're not actually pushing you forward. And that is one reason why after the colonial empires finally collapsed in the 50s and 60s, um, economic development and, um, you know, organic development in these places has proved so difficult. You, you can't say that simply by building railways that actually helped develop and enrich these societies. It is not that straightforward. What, what was brought was also taken away. And unfortunately, the two cannot be separated one from the other. There's a really good book as well called uh, by, yeah. by Sheikh Anta Diop, who is a scientist mm -hmm. and an anthropologist um, of Senegal who wrote Pre-Colonial Black Africa and a number of books. Um, he died in 1989. I suggest going on, on Amazon, buying or, or wherever you, A books or mm -hmm. thrift books, buy whatever you can buy by, by Sheikh Anta Diop. And uh, mm -hmm. some of the best analysis of what Africa was before colonialism, I found pulled together by, by this amazing mind. Um, definitely, that's a good start, at least for the Africa mm. front. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of books on, on India as well. Mm. Ricardo Alfonso says, I personally know someone whose husband was involved with plundering Russia in the 90s. She completely believes that her class should dominate lesser peoples, including exterminating them, but she donates to charity, though. Interesting comment. And... Uh, uh, Adsum Kurt says, how can multipolarism save Haiti from the West? What would Haiti need to do, in your opinion? Invite Russia, Chinese troops, join the BRICS? I mean, Haiti's, Haiti's been really abused. Um, I mean, you know, you got the Clinton Foundation running amok, doing all sorts of shady things on so many levels. Uh, it's been so... I mean, I, 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 I like history. You know, I, I think movements that have the best... Mm -hmm. Uh, kick and value that sort of scare the oligarchy are, are the ones that utilize historic precedents that are that are solid. And I think Toussaint Louverture, I mean, he, P Haiti was the world's second republic after the United States. Um, Alexander Hamilton helped Toussaint Louverture craft the Haitian constitution, um, modeled on some of the best elements of what's in the U.S. constitution. And so, you know, unfortunately much of the time, the, the worst elements of the U.S., you know, the, these fifth colonists I, 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 I write about often uh, took power positions in the U.S. and didn't follow through with those promises for mutual development and aid and became instead complicit um, in the abuse that was suffered by, by Haiti. Um, you, you need water. You need, you need infrastructure. You need, you need a coal. I mean, the, right now, the only countries that have an attitude that could provide for the type of large scale in, infrastructure investment that Haiti so desperately requires and to, to help them stand on their own two feet again and, and become sovereign, mm -hmm. maybe for the first time, is, is China and, and Russia. And I mean, the, the sphere of influence that they represent could be the only saving grace. I don't know what, in the short term at least, could turn things around for Haiti. I, I don't know. <laughs> David S. says, any sense of the outcome of the so-called Arab summit in D.C. at this point? Now I'm going to refrain from commenting on that. 
Okay, let's let's finish it off on on a positive question, I guess. Well, let's see if we can make this into a positive answer. Mm -hmm. From Barry, what events can bring in, can bring a sleepwalking young generation into sensible minds to bring a brighter future? Hmm. hmm. Well, I, I think this this process this is something which couldn't have been done at any previous point in in previous generations, right? This type of uh, town hall meeting experience that uh, you guys here at the Duran have been able to to maintain and create as an amplifier of ideas that are that are heretical. <laughs> there's there's a certain whole spectrum of ideas that that one is not supposed to be allowed to even contemplate within the type of society we are supposed to be living under. And yet, bam, you have created a platform that has made this, that has facilitated this in a, in a very organic way. And a lot of people have done very similar things. <coughs> so, <clears throat> on the one hand, I mean, the answer is partially in my mind, uh, I don't have a full answer, obviously, but I, I get part of it is subjective. You know, we all have to think about how we can tap into uh, our potential and do more than simply be what is expected of us as this mediocre adaptive, you know, we're all being expected to just be mediocre as possible, adaptive to the standards that are created for us by a, a grouping of social engineers that, that have really lowered the bar of what is, you know, supposed to be considered normal um, in society. So we got to expect more of ourselves, much some, you know, and I think getting out of your skin, out of your comfort zone, so that find yourself more as an instrument teaching, uh, whether you're writing articles, whether you're you're speaking, whether you're setting up uh, organized groups with your friends to read or watch documentaries and think and discuss ideas that are of a high value. Um, that th this is very important right now. The, again, the internet being what it is, it's it's there's a battle for what the internet is going to become. Right now, it's still sort of that early age Gutenberg press thing where there is more freedom of press before a lot of the uh, <laughs> a, a lot of very nefarious interests started monopolizing it and only only allowing certain acceptable uh, bad ideas to be printed. But we're still at that early phase where it could go in a very good direction. Um, mm. So we have to use what we got it and make it better. And mm. or, again, look at the best examples of social movements that resisted imperialism in, a, in an effective way in the mm. past and not the romantic type of rah, 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 run out into the you know, like an anarchist mob against the, the establishment. That never works. Look at Black Lives Matter, these poor schmucks, you know, romantic idiots who are just like deployed and weaponized like a mob because they didn't think. But if you really look at what Martin Luther King Jr., how did he do what he did? He wasn't fully successful because he was killed when he was 38. But look what he did and what were his techniques of, of organizing and of uh, in, ex expressing broad, powerful concepts in a very metaphorical loving language to create leaders out of people who were wanted to just be followers. And he created a movement that, that was very viable based on his studies of the best of what worked with Gandhi. Um, you got to look at, you know, listen to JFK, listen to JFK speeches, think about policies of what, what resisted oligarchs, what, what do oligarchs not like? What, what has re reduced their power in history? And then study those things and try to think about how you could apply that in your own context in whatever part of the world you happen to be living in with like-minded people. Um, I don't have a silver bullet, though. I don't have a, I don't have a magic bullet, I should say. There, there's no simple answer, but it is subjective. A, a big chunk of this thing is subjective because there's a lot more mm -hmm. of us than there are of them. But the, the us have to, at the same time, uh, operate on a, on a higher intellectual level than we, we've been used to. <laughs> I would agree. I, I just get sorry. Am I? No, I'm, go ahead, go ahead, yeah, I, I, good. I, I'm just going to make one observation, which is that I find, especially among young people, but just generally people general, in, in general, there is an awful lot of dissatisfaction and criticism of the status quo. It's just that it hasn't found yet its proper means of expression, its proper means of political expression. But an iron rule is that where when dissatisfaction and unhappiness exists, that vehicle does eventually come. It always happens. And, you know, don't talk about people having to be wake, woken up. Eventually, they will wake up by themselves. That's always what's happened in the past. You'll see how it will gradually... <laughs> 
people will pick ideas off each other. More people will go into hall, town halls, if you like, euphemistically town halls. Those ideas will spread. Alternative literatures will appear. It's happened before, and it will happen again. If you take anti-imperialism in Britain, a country I know very well, um, it began to take off in a very big way in the late 19th century because people in Britain who were under a lot of pressure began to realise that imperialism, the, the structure of power that was creating it, was actually pushing them down too. And an anti-imperialist language and thinking gradually developed in Britain alongside um, a lot of other movements that were focused on domestic change as well. So it will come. All right. Edward says, just to note the popularity of the Duran, as of now, 7.5 thousand people are watching Sky News Live. 5.7 thousand are watching the Duran. Keep going, boys. Well, You'll we're going to do a lot better than that. We'll, 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 we will indeed. And I'll tell you one thing else, which is an awful lot more people are going to watch this program <laughs> over the course of the day and beyond that. And we'll be well ahead of Sky News. So I thank you. And thank you, Alan. Mm -hmm. Island Popsicle for that super kind chat as well. We will end it there. And uh, what a fantastic live stream this was. Mm -hmm. Matthew Eret, thank you very, very much for, uh, for joining us on this live. I have all of your information in the description box down below. But where can people find you how can people follow you you have books you have articles oh you're yeah. on uh you're on podcasts on on tv shows what's the best way for people to connect with you right the plug yeah thank you cool um, absolutely the the best thing to do would be to go to well buy the book if if people want to buy the books either the untold history of canada four volume series or the clash of the two americas i was going to end it as a trilogy but now it's going to be a I realized that there's something I forgot to talk about. So it's going to be a part four uh, to the trilogy uh, coming out in January on the Anglo-Venetian roots of the deep state. If you want to pick up any of these things, go to CanadianPatriot.org. You could also get there two things. Uh, my wife just pr produced her first book, uh, The Empire in Which the Black Sun Never Set. Uh, the Birth of International Fascism and uh, Anglo-American foreign policy. It's a crazy book. I mean, there, there's this, this is deep, deep into the weeds. That's also available on CanadianPatriot.org. And the last thing is uh, we just co-produced a special report, 75 pages big on um, breaking free of anti-China psyops, going through just different, putting into context a lot of the, the lies, narrative reframings that we see coming out of very dishonest forces right now, trying to confuse um, a lot of Westerners to think that their arch nemesis is China, who's behind all of the bad things happening in the world. And we just put, we, we, we debunk a lot of those myths and put a lot of things into context. And that's also on CanadianPatriot.org. The last thing I'll say, Substack, that's my bread and butter. So MatthewEret.Substack.com, um, that always helps. Absolutely. Follow Matt on Substack. Definitely go there as well. And Canadian Patriot. All those links will be down below in the description box. And as a pinned comment as well, Matt, thank you very, very much for joining us today. Very much appreciated. Alexander in London, always appreciated. Your, uh, your insights and your thoughts, of course. You are the Oracle of London. And thank you to everyone who has been watching us on Rumble, on Odyssey, on YouTube, on Rockfin, on Telegram as well, and the Duran.locals.com. Thank you to our Duran community on Locals. And a big thank you to our moderators, Zariel, Alan Watson, Reckless Abandon, William justice did i miss anybody moderating mm. did i miss somebody moderating i don't think so i think i got everybody <clears throat> thank you everyone for a great live stream have a fantastic morning afternoon or evening take care thanks